in here today and uh, welcome to Monday. We certainly are looking at a different Monday than we were looking at a week ago today. It's hard to imagine um, when you're outside today or outside this weekend that this past week actually ever happened. So um, the crisis um, week, a lot of crises happened, a lot of issues happened, um, a lot of situations were put out um, in front of us to deal with, and I am really proud of the city's response. I am proud of um, the strength that we showed, but then I also know that we will take advantage of um, re-looking at some of the things that we did and, and how we reacted, and look at it in terms of what we might have been able to do better, what we could have done better. That being said, I am very proud of the work and effort and plans that were put in place to take care of all of the events that happened that one just seemed to pile on top of the other. We probably won't have another event like this for another 50 years, but we can't bet on that. So I think the thing that we can bet on is, is that we need to reevaluate this situation in light of what happened and see if there was anything that we could have done better, whether it's in communication, reaction, uh, etc. So we will do that and I want to assure all the citizens that we will look at it from top to bottom. We will look at it from how we managed it, how our systems function, how our infrastructure exists and see what we can do to assure the citizens that their frustrations and the pain that they've gone through over the past week that they don't have to look at that, um, that they can look at that in the rearview mirror and know that there's there will be a different day and um, that we will do our best to improve the situation if we can. And we certainly will try. I also want to thank everyone that's here today. Billy DeWitt and Tommy Hebert are here from our council. Uh, we have Daniel Valenzuela, our city manager, Shane Kelton, and Allison Struby, which will all make some comments, as well as Teresa James. I want to add a little bit to the conversation that we had on Saturday, and that is relative to FEMA and the um, declaration that the state of Texas, um, the FEMA declaration or uh, emergency management issues that we requested from the federal government and the response that we received from them. I'm going to read a little bit of this just so I make sure I don't mess it up. I think I left some keywords out and maybe some key points out on last Saturday's um, press conference, so I want to make sure I'm very clear today in terms of uh, what I am saying. Uh, from the good news is that the White House approved public assistance for emergency protective measures in all 254 counties. The bad news is that individual assistance was only approved for 77 counties. And our county was one of those that was not approved. That being said, however, does not mean we are out, of, out in the cold on this issue. What it does mean is that we will be asking and we need, uh, we are pleading for all of our assistance, uh, all of our citizens to go online and fill out the survey uh, to, re to, um, uh, to make sure that we document the disaster dollar amount. You'll have to have pictures. We'll need to see pictures of the broken water lines, roof damage, whatever damage that you might have. So you're going to need to take pictures. You're going to need to fill out the survey. If we don't do that and we don't come up to a dollar amount that is required for us to reach in order to get individual assistance, then individual assistance will not exist for our county. So it is really up to each and every one of our citizens who experienced disaster in their homes to fill out that survey. That survey is online. It is available. If you'll go to the City of San Angelo's webpage, you will see on the front page um, where that survey is and how to reach it so that you can fill it out. But it is up to each and every one of us um, to fill that out. The dollar amount that we have to reach is, I think, close to $450,000. And so it's a big number. So now that means both your businesses and individual homes residential. So it's not just residential loan only. It also includes your um, businesses. Um, and these numbers are kind of shocking that Senator Perry 
sent these to us, and he says there are about 1,400 water systems or 15 million people that were impacted by this storm and on a boil water notice. It's pretty mind-boggling. So we're not the only ones who've gone through this, but we are, we are the citizens of this city, and it is our citizens that we need to fight hard for and to work as quickly and as, uh, as we can to make sure that you get back all of the infrastructure issues, including water, um, into your homes. For those of you who might not have water in your homes because you have a broken water line, Shane Kelton will go over what you can do um, as it relates to that issue. But I think we have some good news today, so I want to turn this over to Allison Struby so she can talk through where we're at at this moment with the water. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have good news to report, and I hope that most all citizens are realizing that good news. Um, we are back to more normal operating procedures at the water treatment plant, as well as normal operating levels that we see in tanks. Um, I believe we've been talking about flow rates and how we have increased those over the past couple days to fill those tanks. Um, the max flow rate we pushed out of the plant was 27 MGD, or million gallons per day. Um, currently, we're producing 13 million gallons a day and that is more in line uh, with the seasonal type flows that we see uh, as we approach spring. Um, we have been flushing uh, the system as well as checking pressures throughout the system. If you do not have pressure and you do not believe you have a broken water main or a broken service line, you need to contact us uh, so that we can work through that issue with you. Um, we have also began sampling today. Our water quality division uh, dispatched about four crews out to start the sampling process. And this is a part of the bowl water notice, so they are doing those bacteriological samples. Uh, those do take 18 hours, um, and they are out collecting those samples right now. The other thing uh, we want customers to know is that um, some residents have um, experienced odor or they see discoloration in those lines. Uh, that can be caused by some of those service lines holding water for a period of time. It just didn't have enough pressure to make it up into your home uh, when, we, when our system was down. So just flush your lines. Um, and obviously, we will put out information once the bull water notice is rescinded about what filters you should replace and how you should go about flushing your system. System. Um, we've also encouraged customers to start back into your normal routine, ease back into that, um, washing you know, one load of laundry that can get you through the next few days rather than washing all 10 loads of laundry that you may have at this point. Um, start taking quick showers and then slowly ease our way back into our normal routine and our normal water usage. And I believe that is all the updates that I have at this point. So I'll let Shane talk about the distribution sites uh, for those. Let's see if there's any questions first based off of this information. Is there any questions that I can answer while I'm up here at the podium? Hello? Okay, we can hear you. John Tufts, San Angelo Standard Times. Under ideal circumstances, when is the soonest that residents could possibly expect to have the boil water notice rescinded? Uh, we're hoping sometime maybe lunch or after uh, tomorrow, depending on what time all the samples uh, come back. Uh, it will be dependent upon those results, uh, but hopefully we get everything put on test this afternoon, so we're looking at sometime tomorrow afternoon for rescinding it. At Cerno Fox, West Texas. Now, will this include all of San Angelo, even the Paul Ann area? Because before this happened, Paul Ann was still in the red. Correct. So all of the areas right now, except for the red, are in a bull water notice. Um, so our samples will include covering all of those areas, including samples that we're taking uh, this morning in the Paul Ann area. We have over 50 distribution sample sites that we have taken those samples from that are representative of the whole city.
Hey, as, as we're moving forward, we know that there are quite a few homes out there, homeowners out there that have broken uh, water lines in their homes and have had to have their meters turned off and are without currently without any water whatsoever. And so we have established two sites uh, for non-potable water um, distribution, that is at the San Angelo Stadium and also at Foster uh, Communications Coliseum. Um, and for both of those sites, uh, we would ask that the people come to those sites and bring their containers, uh, whether those are buckets or five gallon jugs, whatever it is, and we will distribute uh, water there. Uh, at those sites for non potable uh, for the non potable use if uh, if we have uh, folks out there that are uh, handicapped or elderly uh, and cannot uh, come to those sites uh, they can call three two five four eight six three seven seven six and leave their name their phone number and their address and we will have um, we will have city staff bring water to non potable water to them so they can continue to flush their toilets um, and, and try to maintain um, uh, maintain their homes as best as possible I also just want to give out a few phone numbers for those customers that currently have their water off but may be either repairing their um, broken service lines themselves or having a plumber do that. They can call our customer service to get turned back on once those repairs have been made. But it's 325-657-4323 for customer service. Um, and if it is after hours, please call 325-657-4295. Thank you. Yes, customer service is 325-657-4323 or after hours or if you want to report a main break, 325-657-4295. Thank you. I have a question, uh, Matt Trammell, San Angelo Live. Um, there's been distribution for water set up for non-potable water, but will there be a drinking water uh, distribution site set up? We do have some bottled water, and it's, it's very limited, so we want to make sure that those individuals that are actually going through the uh, stadium or the Coliseum for the non-potable, uh, we'll have some bottled water. Again, we ask our citizens, the ones that already have access to water, uh, they can just boil it. What we want to do is we make that available to individuals that have absolutely no water, that have frozen pipes, you know, that if they do come through, we want to be able to help them. But we do ask the citizens that already have access to water, please don't go through that line. It's, it's strictly for those individuals that have absolutely no water. Meaning broken water lines? Correct. Broken Anything, water. Main, water yeah. Off. So that's it. So again, water meters turned off or uh, they have water lines that burst, and so they have no access to water. Those are the individuals that we want to make sure that they're getting that drinking water as well. So please, people, citizens, we ask, we plead that uh, you just allow those individuals that don't have access to water to come through, and we'll help those individuals out. I really want to emphasize the fact that the uh, 77 counties that were not included in the original uh, declaration for assistance, there is the, there, um, I don't want anyone to think that there was something the city didn't do, that we didn't follow up, that we didn't fill out a form, that we didn't sign a form. This is a process that has been put into place by the um, de the Federal Emergency Management Assistance Program. It is not anything we've done or not done. So there's no blame for these 77 counties being omitted. What it is is some of the smaller areas of the state of Texas, and we will follow the correct procedures so that we hope if our citizens fill out the paperwork that's necessary, that we will become a part of the 254 counties in total. So this is not a, a black mark on the city. It's a process that we have to go through because we were not included. And so just to remember that um, we will get this done if every citizen does their part. That's the most important part. Um, just because we weren't part of the original 77 counties does not mean we won't be available for assistance. 
CPS. Any idea what kind of public assistance Tom Green County might be getting yes. from FEMA? What the, the, it says your county judge or emergency management coordinator will be doing something similar for the public infrastructure that was damaged during this storm. They are also turning in state of Texas assistance re, uh, request, which is a STAR request for local needs, whether that is bottled water shipments, food distribution, or generators and fuel. Distribution sites run by local jurisdictions are reimbursable under the disaster declaration, and that is for counties. Could any of that assistance go to repairing water, main to, uh, water mains to offset the cost to taxpayers? We introduced, I believe, on Friday at City Council, um, a declaration that allows people under certain income levels to apply for assistance. And certainly people have homeowners insurance that if you have insurance, many of these expenses in fact will be covered by your homeowners insurance. But we did approve an emergency declaration on Friday um, for assistance for those uh, households making um, certain income levels based off of the number of people in the household. Jalen Lewis with uh, KSAN KLST, and I just want to ask, you know, people may not have access to the internet. How can people without internet access um, be able to fill out the survey? I believe we printed copies, and they are in the Annex building, which is the old First Financial Bank building, which is our water department. We have printed copies of the survey that may be filled out there. Again, the most important part for all citizens to understand is you must have photographs. You must take photographs of the damage before the repairs. Tommy, Billy, would you like to add some comments? Oh, sorry, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Mayor. Earlier you said you were hoping to make changes to the infrastructure. Um, what are some of those changes that you have in mind? And when can the community expect to see them as soon as possible? I'm not going to specifically name anything at this point. It's going to be a big conversation. There will be a lot of conversation about priorities down the road. There will be conversations about what might be able to be done on a, on a much sooner basis. But it's going to be a big conversation. It's not going to be something that we'll be able to um, do a magic wand and solve all of the issues, first of all, because our water system is set up a certain way. The ability to change the way that water system flows is not going to be a big change. That's pretty much an impossibility. That does not mean that there aren't things that we need to look at. We certainly, you know, this time of the year, we would not have expected that we would have had to pull in as much water from the Hickory Aquifer that we had to. But because this is the time of the year when water usage is usually lower, so they were doing water repairs on OH Ivy, right? OH Ivy. Things like that that would normally not be in the month of February. And we would have been able to take advantage of our water resources there. They were down. It was a perfect storm. You know, we, I think we've used that terminology a lot. Absolutely a perfect storm. The combination of power and water and maintenance all happened to happen in the same seven days. And for San Angelo, it was a little bit worse because, in fact, we had the contamination water issue the week before. So we really went through two weeks of a water crisis, if you will. Many cities have gone through water crisis, and some of them much worse than ours. But they didn't have the previous week that we had to live through. So ours kind of compounded because of that contamination issue. So it made it harder on individuals. We were up and down and in and out and on and off because of all of the situations attached to the, con the contamination as well as this um, water pressure issue. But again, I repeat, we would be wrong if we didn't look back on the past seven days or the past 14 days and not analyze it and say, in retrospect, what would have we done? How could have we done it differently? Is there anything that we can do that if this happened next week or next month or next year that we would change up what the system does or the infrastructure exists? I mean, below 
I mean, these temperatures were crazy below, and it does tremendous damage to water lines, frozen, I mean, the fact that natural gas froze up, the fact that wind towers froze up. I mean, we're talking about catastrophic events that the state of Texas has never gone through. And it add to that, most of us did not understand how the power grid worked. I don't think most of us had heard of ERCOT before last week happened. We're learning names and, and um, information that in a traditional year, in a traditional day, we would have not needed to understand that system like we did. You know, AEP was um, surprised by a lot of the things that happened. They were not in control. They're pretty used to being in control. And it's, you know, we typically can pick up the phone and call AEP and they have a quick response. They can immediately tell us what the situation is, what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. In this case, ERCOT dictated a lot to them, meaning that they determined how much power was going to come to our city. And then even when they committed to that number, very often in the afternoon, they took some of that power away. So what we would consider a traditional brownout or blackout was not a traditional brownout or blackout. It was all the way out. And many people lived through that. So um, you know, we're on a learning curve about some of those things. And you certainly know that all of the people who, um, the legislators who represent us are working hard f to better understand ERCOT themselves we were all caught off guard. Um, it's amazing. It's, um, you know, you wake up one day and you don't have power and you hear somebody else is in charge of it and your local supplier AEP is not even in charge of it. And then you learn that Atmos gas is running low because it froze. It, it, it froze. I mean, so there's a large learning curve at every level right now. And we want to be a part of that learning curve. And we want to react to that. Thank you. As part of the city discussion, uh, the big conversation that city leaders are going to have, will winterization of future infrastructure be part of that conversation? I'm going to let someone who's more knowledgeable about conversations like that, or more technical, I should say, and um, address that. I'm not sure. Um, what that might be. I think as it pertains to the water system, we talked about that ultimately it wasn't power that was our biggest issue of why we lost pressure, why we lost volume in the tanks. It was due to the winter um, effects on our pumps, airlines, uh, control valves, control boxes, those type of things. So I do think looking at our winterization and our protection on those sources will be a part of the conversation. Right now, residents are very concerned about their water bills. Will city leaders have any kind of discussions about lowering uh, everyone's water bill by a certain percentage? Have any of those discussions taken place? Those discussions have not been taken place, but I think that that would be a part of the overall discussion when we talk about winterization and pipeline replacement and all of those type of things. All of those will take extremely large capital dollars. Um, and so money will be a part of that, whether it's on the citizen side or in the cost of infrastructure and upgrading our infrastructure. How soon could this conversation happen then? I think we are still in the bull water notice. Um, and so we are still, um, while we have regained pressure and we've regained tank volumes, I think we need to get out of the bull water notice and then we need to start prioritizing um, how we build that into next year's budget and those type of things. Uh, the city mentioned that crews from McAllen, Texas came in to help inspections in the Paul Ann area to try and narrow down the source of the contamination, but due to the severe winter storm, they had to leave. Have those crews returned? Is the city closer to narrowing down a source of the contamination in Paul Ann at this time? Um, no, we are still investigating that. Um, the McAllen crews uh, came for, I believe, two or three days. I'm not quite sure how long it exactly was, but they were able to go through many businesses um, and do those inspections. And so we'll be going through, uh, once we receive reports from them, uh, going through those details and then further investigating uh, the, the cause of the contamination.
kind of uh, clear up the numbers a little bit, how much would it cost to replace a mile of the water pipe? It depends on the size of that line. So, I mean, an 8 inch versus a, a 20 inch. Uh, a line down College Hills. I mean, just like, uh, just an average, just, you know what I mean? Just an average, uh, do you have an average number for that? Uh, there's so many things that go into that, but I'm going to spout off uh, $2 million. Okay, uh, how, how many miles of pipe are there in San Angelo that would need to be replaced or in just general? Um, I don't know the exact numbers of, say, cast iron or AC lines. Those are the ones that are the older in the system versus PVC, but we have roughly over 700 miles of water of water mains. But I don't know the breakdowns in between. Right, but that knows, that's a huge number if you have to replace the whole entire thing. Correct. Do you ever see that this uh, that we would have to replace the whole entire water line with the problems that we're having? No, I don't envision that we'd have to replace the entire system. Um, a couple years ago, I believe, when we did our water master plan, they were looking at over $100 million worth of infrastructure replacement needs at that time. Um, are we still fighting any water main breaks in the city right now? Yes. Water main breaks are an everyday occurrence um, in San Angelo. Uh, we are seeing some of those as they thaw out or as those repressurize. We are still seeing some main breaks, and so we'll continue to work those as they come about. Could that, aff could that affect the chart with if they keep happening uh, on and off, or, or do you think we're past that uh, the dip down in the chart where uh, we we're losing pressure? If we continue to have uh, main breaks on smaller mains like 6, 8, 12-inch diameter, we still have enough tank volume uh, to keep that um, repressurization for the most part of the city. Um, what our biggest, I guess, obstacle was, was the freezing weather at that time. We were able, unable to get pumps on, get valves uh, turned and those type of things due to the freezing weather. It wasn't so much a supply issue um, and we've built back that supply and obviously we aren't fighting that freezing weather anymore. And just my last question is, will uh, any citizens uh, currently in the next month expect a higher water bill than usual? It, I would not think so because there was a period of time where customers were not using. Um, but if a customer has issues with the volume of water that they're being billed for, they can always call our customer service to discuss that. I will address one of the comments that, that was just made, but also I'd like Shane to come forward and talk about what happens underground with these water lines during these kinds of temperatures and what would traditionally be you know, our, temp our typical uh, temperature that we do okay under, and then at what point do we start to lose? And you might not be able to add to that, Shane, so I don't mean to put you on the spot, but, you know, these were abnormal temperatures, and they were abnormal across the entire state. I mean, my family lives in Kansas, and it's a really cold part of Kansas, and they were going, lit, you know, wow, you've gotten more snow and that's a snow country up there. You've gotten more snow in 2021 than we have in western Kansas. You've had colder temperatures this week than we've had in western Kansas. So this was catastrophic. You know, we, these, this was an event, a very historical event. And so, um, of course, our pipes aren't built for that historical kind of event. But you ask about College Hills, and that tends to be an area where we have some, sometimes the big break there, and we will be addressing College Hills in 2021, the utilities. So we know that by looking at the utilities on College Hills, that it will start to take some of the pressure off other breaks if we get it fixed. So even though we won't be able to start total road repair on College Hills, we're going to start utility work this year. And that should help some of those big breaks that we've had. Shane? In our in normal system, you know, in our normal weather patterns um, that we that we typically see when we see weather uh, temperatures dip down below freezing, uh, you know, if, if we get down into the mid 20s or low 20s or even in the teens, and it's just for a day or two, our system is typically uh, designed to sustain those type of temperatures. When we start seeing temperatures fall below freezing and stay below freezing for several days in a row, we start seeing those uh, temperatures drop down in that around that zero. Uh, degree mark, 
then that's where our infrastructure is not designed uh, or built to, to handle that. And a lot of times what you see and, and what causes a lot of the main breaks that we're seeing when, these, uh, when we start seeing uh, freezing of that is when the ground actually starts freezing and we start seeing these, those upper layers of ground start freezing, it starts causing shifts, uh, especially in, our, uh, in more of the clay soils that we have here in town. And so when you start seeing that freezing with the moisture levels, contents that we have right now, you'll start seeing shifting of the ground and that does ha have a tendency to cause more of the main breaks that we're seeing and, and a lot of the service um, meter services that we see and a lot of leaks around the meter services uh, because those are much closer to the surface of the ground uh, in, in a box. And so we start seeing a lot more of, of leaks in those areas as well, too. Uh, and while I'm up here in, an, in another topic, when we start talking about infrastructure and roadways, uh, this was, uh, again, th this weather that we just saw this past week is the worst weather that we could ever think of or dream of for a roadway. Um, we saw with all of the snow uh, and how long it hang, hung around, uh, turning into slush uh, for, for two or three days on the street and all the water. As cars drive over that, it just helps, pen helps penetrate that water into our base even quicker and it gets in there and then all of a sudden we see a 13 degree night or a 14 or 10 degree night after that initial melt starts happening and that water gets down into that base. And so when it starts separating the pavement, the, the asphalt actually from uh, the road base itself and so we start seeing huge large sections of roadway start peeling up of the asphalt start peeling up. So we will see a lot of that around town. There is going to be a lot of road damage around town. Uh, we're aware of it. We actually have crews out right now starting to assess all of the damage that we know is already out there and exists uh, on our roadways. And we will be bringing, uh, bringing um, my guys will be bringing all that information to me and we will be going through multiple scenarios to see how we can address the roadways as expeditiously as possible. Uh, not to mention with all of the water breaks that we have uh, and the trench repair that we're going to be doing uh, behind all the main breaks as well too. So, uh, from the from an infrastructure standpoint. So, if we take a look at a game plan, obviously the game plan is laid out by Shane and Allison. Is we got to take care of the immediate problems and the re immediate issues that exist with things such as roadways. Uh, and at the same point in time, we need to be talking about the game plan going forward and what we might be able to do. Um, we're, we're, we, will, we will learn a lot from this past week. We, we will take action. What that action will be, we don't know right now. But we do know that uh, it was catastrophic. We're not used to this. It hasn't happened in, as we say, as far as we know ever. So some of the things are things that we wouldn't be able to control or change or do, but we got to relook at it, rethink it, and replan for the future based off of what we know and what we've learned. But we got to first, first of all, take care of the problems that exist. Tommy, Billy. Thank you, Mayor. I just I want to say a few things. One of the things when you look at this perfect storm event that we have certainly had over the last couple of weeks, um, some of the things were out of our control as city leadership, but some of the things we have oversight for. When um, you take a leadership position, you certainly have responsibility for oversight and accountability. And I just want to assure citizens that may be watching, listening to this, that we take that very seriously. So a lot of the questions that have been asked here today about um, water rate um, decreases perhaps and about what are we going to do to make sure that we're ready and more prepared perhaps for this happening again, those are certainly things, as the mayor called it, you know, having the bigger conversation because that is our responsibility. That is what we're accountable for, ensuring that we pay proper oversight to what needs to be done, what needs to happen. So I think we've gotten some really good information here today on the specifics of what happened, what temperatures caused it to happen. We don't have all the answers for how we're going to take a look at 
um, systems in the future, but that conversation will take place. And I think that uh, the citizens are going to hold us accountable to make sure that those conversations um, take place. So we're going to do that. The other thing that I wanted to uh, speak to was the tremendous outreach by citizens in San Angelo to help others. I have read and heard so many stories that are encouraging about neighbor helping neighbor. If somebody has power, somebody doesn't, they are welcome to go other places. I've seen it on Facebook, I've seen it on Next Door Neighbor. So that's what San Angelo is. We are a community that cares about each other. So um, I just want to say thank you to the citizens of San Angelo for their patience, for enduring the crisis. Now, all of us in this room probably shared some of that um, this past two weeks, but our citizens have shown a great deal of patience and I thank them for that and I thank them for the kind words that they've had and the understanding that they've had. And another unsung hero that I wanna give a shout out to is Brian Groves, our communication director. Brian does a fantastic job on communicating and updating all of the sites. And we appreciate him so much. He's done a really good job. And if somebody gives us feedback that they didn't get information on something specific, he is really quick to respond to that. So we owe him a huge debt of gratitude for all of the hard work that he's put in. The other group I wanna call out because, you know, Allison and Shane and they're standing here, but they have tremendous te um, teams that work with them, that are down in the ditches, that are repairing water mains when we have eight degrees weather. And we certainly do appreciate them and all the time, work and effort. I had one email from uh, one of my residents that said, you know, she went through all that they do. She said, and then they go home and they have no water. They can't even take a shower. And they have worked you know, in the cold. They have no heat, no shower. So they suffered right along with us. So um, we just all owe them a big um, debt of gratitude for that. And going forward, I want to assure citizens that we will be having those conversations about what, if anything, we can do to address our systems to ensure that not only are we better prepared, but that we fix, put some fixes in place. That's what you do when you have a crisis and you go through a crisis and you come out on the other side, then you take a look backwards and see what happened. Could we have done anything differently? And that's what we'll be doing. So um, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Ditto to everything that has already been said here. Um, to Brian Groves, to Shane, to Allison, um, to, to all your teams. One thing I would add, um, I am a person of faith. Um, in our Sunday school class yesterday, um, the gratitude for all the city staff, every one of you, Teresa, your name was called, Daniel, your name was called, Shane, Allison, Y'all's names were called and a prayer of gratitude and a prayer of um, uh, thanksgiving, but also to continue to be with these people um, as, as the, the crisis may continue. We hope, we hope we're at the end of it. But I wanted you all to know that, um, that everybody does appreciate what you all have done. So thank you. Questions, comments? This concludes the press conference.